Repeat after me, please. When you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm hot this evening. Look out. <laughs> So, y'all out there fanning like y'all about to get happy or something. Look at <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Now, let me tell you what this is symbolic. We set it up just this way. The reason that we are here this evening, to talk about Joe versus the volcano. And so what I wanted you to do was to really experience this. <laughs> now, what is it when you're near a volcano that's, that's boiling over and about to explode. What is it that you feel that lets you know you are in the area of a volcano? What is it you feel? Heat. Oh, I know, I know. You feel heat, right? So you're going to experience this volcano because we have things in our lives, ladies and gentlemen, and because we don't handle them, because we don't deal with those things, they begin to get kind of hot. You know, you, you've heard the expression, boy, I'm in hot water. Have you ever heard that before? Yes. And that means that there's something that you're in, that some dilemma that you've got to handle, something that you've got to deal with. So let's begin to look at this guy called Joe versus the volcano, and let's see what's in it for us. I took the liberty of changing some things to enable them to be symbolic for us. And Tom Hanks plays his role, and for those of you that have not seen the movie, it's about a guy who was going to work every day. It was very depressing. I mean, when you see it, I mean, the photography is very dingy looking and gray and very dim lighting and, and the people are going and looking drab, doing the same old thing every day in the same old way. Some of you work with people like that. There are faces that you wish you never ever saw. Am I right? I mean, if you never saw them again, it would be too soon. I am I right? I'm going right, all right? So this is what was going on. This guy was going into this job where it was a dead end job. He wasn't happy, he was miserable, and many of us can identify with that. He knew that he was capable of doing more but he had really given up on himself. He had really sold himself out. Yeah, some of us have done that. He made a trade-off. For whatever reason, he decided to do this. That's why we can identify with him. And the volcano is symbolic of the challenges that we invariably face in life, of the problems that many of us run away from handling. And he had to handle this. And how did he come in contact with this volcano? Well. What happened was he was going to this doctor constantly. He's a hypochondriac because he wasn't living his purpose. His dream had not found his life work. He would create illnesses for himself. And so what happened in the process, this doctor decided, he set him up really. See, when you're not living your goal, you go through life living like a victim. People can set you up for anything. They can run any kind of game on you and you go for it. I had a saying when I was in radio, stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. Well, Joe didn't believe in very much, including himself and his dreams, see? So he was very vulnerable. And so Joe was set up by this doctor. This doctor told him that he had a rare disease and he had six months to live. This disease was called a brain cloud. <laughs> oh, could double Joe went for it. <laughs> he believed it. But you know something? It changed his life. It changed his life. And so he was told, look here, you, you, don't, you don't have long to live anyhow. The guy said, why don't you do this? I'm going to give you all my credit cards, and this way you can live like a king, and there's something I want you to do. There was a catch. There's a volcano on an island that's about to erupt, and, and unless somebody jumps in that volcano, sacrifice their life, these people on this island will perish. Well, your life isn't worth much, and you don't have that long anyhow. <laughs> So why don't you take my credit cards, all my credit cards, American Express, Master Charge, all of them, take all of them, go live like a king and die like a man. And Joe said, okay. What did he have to lose? He was going to die anyhow. And his life didn't have any meaning and value to him as it was. So this was no big sacrifice on Joe's behalf. Now that says something about us, people, human beings that when you have not structured your life so that it can have some meaning and value for you, that you'll be willing to throw your life away into anything. See, the volcano could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be a job that does not meet who you are. 
that you go through life, you're doing it so long, you, you're operating in this and you're acting out that role of mediocrity for so long, you think it's you. It could be a relationship that's no longer giving you what you want and creating dis-ease in your body. It could be any kind of circumstance, like in his work environment, it was toxic, it wasn't good for him. But he didn't have the guts to do anything about it, to act on it. So therefore, it was making him miserable. And as a result, he couldn't see the beauty of life. In fact, in the movie, see, they had in the concrete, there was a, a daisy growing up through the concrete. But people were so caught up in the depression and the gloominess of life, they couldn't even see the daisy when somebody just stepped on it one day. They couldn't see the beauty in life. See, that's what can happen to you in life, that you can get so caught up in the misery of it and the pain and the sickness and the depression and playing a victim and blaming everybody and everything rather than taking responsibility. It will blind you from seeing the stuff out there that's really beautiful. That's what Henry David Thoreau meant when he said that most people go through life in quiet desperation. They're miserable. I have friends been married for years, live in two different rooms. Why would you live like that? I mean, miserable, don't even talk to each other, grumble. I think that was supposed to mean good morning. <laughs> miserable, just making each other miserable. Every, why live like that? People go to work like that. I said, why even show? I used to work with a guy like that. You couldn't say good morning to him before nine o'clock. He'd look around and say, does he know me? Anybody know me know you don't talk to me before nine o'clock. I don't play that, all right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, the people like, how many ever work with people that are just grumps? Raise your hand, just grump, miserable. Why show up? Come in complaining every day. The best day on the job is when they're absent. <laughs> Am I right? So this is where Joe was. So this doctor told Joe, hey man, you're gonna die with this brain cloud. And you know something? All of Joe's other illnesses left. <laughs> Joe decided to live. Joe decided to live his life. Now that is interesting. A psychiatrist did a study and he was talking about how his patients reacted when they got information that they were going to die immediately. He said that many of these patients that had gone through years of therapy that should have been making decisions about their careers, or about their marriage, or about their circumstances, and somehow or another they were stuck and didn't have the personal power, or the wherewithal, or the willpower to act in their own best interest. But when they were told, listen, you've got three months to live, or you've got six months to live, all of a sudden these people who were initially victims or powerless, all of a sudden they started acting in their own best interest. They started living their lives. And it's amazing to me that, that what a paradox that once people are told they're going to die, all of a sudden they start seeing the daisies in life. They start seeing the beauty in life. I remember it's a monologue and it's called The Last Mile. It's a, it's a monologue about a guy who was sentenced to die in the electric chair for a crime that he did not commit. And he was pleading to the jury to understand his case. And I remember one of the parts of the monologue where this guy talking to the jury and talking to himself and going the whole gamut of emotion and I remember something he said that struck me right now he said you know he said it's queer in it how even though life has done you wrong somehow you still want to live he said you never again find me complaining about life about life has given me a, a short deal no I, I, I just want to live I take the park benches the crumbs I, anything I just I just want to live but they're not going to let me are they all of a sudden this guy who before from Sloat's Corner Indiana never really cared about life all of a sudden now that he knew that his life was going to be taken away for a crime that he did not commit. He wanted to live. It was, it's a very passionate, powerful monologue. I used to read that quite often and study that. So what is it that we can begin to do? Do we have to get a pronouncement that we only have six months to live in order to decide to live? In order to live in a spirit of integrity? See, most of us go through life living a lie. The Platters had a song. Oh yes, 
I'm the great pretender. What a beautiful voice. Oh, don't faint. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. Whew. Now I hit that note, it just gives me a chill. But anyhow, <laughs> that many of us go through life being great pretenders. We should get an Academy Award. Pretending that we're happy. Pretending that we're content. Pretending that everything's happy and gay and carried away. And that's not the way that it is. Going through life feeling that we can't do anything about our situation like Joe did. But when they told Joe he was going to die, Joe became a new person, went back to work, and the young lady he'd been wanting to talk to for a long time, he said, hey, I want to take you out. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't worried about rejection. Joe had his eyes on her. He said, Lord is my shepherd, I'll see what I want. <laughs> I might be going, but I ain't dead yet. <laughs> he wasn't living for a living. You hear me? I like that, Joe. Don't lose that. Don't lose that. All right. So, so here's what I think that we can begin to do. To live our dreams. To begin to let life take on some new meaning for us, some new power and some new value. Is to begin to look for the daisies in your life right now where you are, regardless of what's happening to you, regardless of what's going on with you, begin to look for some beauty in it. Begin to look for some lessons that you can learn from where you are and what you're going through. See, the volcano, see, when Joe jumped into the volcano, and he eventually did that with a young lady that fell in love with him, they were thrown out of the volcano and they survived. Think about that. Now, see, I think that when you decide to take a leap, and you handle the challenges that you're facing, read something about fear. That's one of the things that keeps us from beginning to live life. Here's what happened. Um, this guy, John Rogers, wrote that. He said, when people take the courage to journey into the center of their fear, they find nothing. It is only many layers of fear being afraid of itself. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You're able to say to yourself, I've lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes alone. You must do the thing you cannot do. See, that's what the volcano is. It is the thing that we cannot do. And because it is that, we must do that. Once fear is acted upon, the death of fear is certain. So what volcano you have in your life? Let me ask you some questions here. If you had six months to live, what would you do differently with your life? What would you do differently? Would you have the same job? Would you be worried about things that you're worried about right now? Would you have the same relationships? Would you have the same people in your life? I was sitting on the house of the Ohio legislative floor. I'd just been elected for the third time as a chairman of the Human Resource Committee, powerful, prestigious position, and I was reading a book on how to manage your time in your life, and it talked about what are your long-range goals two to three years from now, what are your short-range goals, six-month goals, and then it said, if you had three months to live, what would you spend your time doing? So I wrote down, I would, I would spend my time, I, one thing, I would resign from the legislature, I would go and back to Miami and I would buy my mother home something I'd promised myself that I was going to do and I had continued to procrastinate and put all kind of reasons why I couldn't do it and you know I wanted to make sure that she was financially secure my children would be financially secure and I would do lectures and I would go around talking to people and working with kids that's what I said I would do then it turned to the next page and it said for all you know you don't have three months to live you might die today so whatever you wrote on the last page, you want to spend as much of your time doing that today. So I looked at Mr. Vern Reif, the Speaker of the Ohio Legislature, and I said to the guy on my right, State Representative Mike Stenziano out of the Ohio State District, I said, Stenzi, 25 years from now, who would care what legislation we passed? He said, nobody would care one year from now. Now here's what was happening with me. I came to the Ohio legislature with great expectations. There are things I wanted to do. I wanted to make a change in society. I wanted to make an impact. 
But I was just disillusioned after being there for a while. I introduced some legislation that I'd worked months to get this legislation passed, got it out of subcommittee, voted to the major committee, and then went from there to the reference committee, and then they introduced it on the Ohio legislative floor. And this legislation was designed to provide protection for senior citizens and poor people who bought money orders. People buy money orders thinking that it's cash. But what they did not know that there's no bond or insurance security in the event that the money order company files bankruptcy. And so this company filed bankruptcy and just left a lot of people just holding worthless paper. So I wanted to introduce some legislation so that senior citizens would not be victims of this anymore. After months of hard work, after introducing the bill and having the votes lined up, guy raised his hand, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Wright said yes. He said, I'd like to introduce the amendment for Mr. Brown's bill. He said, we will hear the amendment. He said, I'd like to amend it and change the word shall to may. I said, excuse me, Mr. Speaker, may I speak please? Yes. I said, ladies and gentlemen of the Ohio legislature, this legislation is not something we wanted to make it optional to provide protection for Ohioans and senior citizens. We want to make it mandatory. And then this guy said, no, Mr. Speaker, I, I just think that he's taking it a little too far. This is an honorable gesture on the behalf of the state, but he's taking it too far. Let's make it optional and leave it up to the goodwill of these money order companies to provide for the protection. Let's have the vote. And they had the vote. And I lost. And I said, oh, wait, wait. This is not why I came here. And then all of a sudden, this job that at one point had meaning to me and value, it no longer had that for me. And all of us have had some experiences where you went to a job and you were excited about that job. Boy, it had so much promise, and then you got there, so much you wanted to do, you thought it was an opportunity for upward mobility and growth and development and expansion. And all of a sudden, after you got there, you found out it was nothing but a glorified cubby hole. Old grave with no dirt on it. So it, be it became very depressing going to work. And so that's what happened to this guy, Joe. And a lot of us have done that before. I used to get my headache stopped throbbing on Sunday afternoon after the Sunday afternoon football game, a basketball game. I just hated to go to work. Some days I just drive by just for nothing, just drive on by. I came back though, I came back. Because I had bills, I came back, you know? <laughs> Many of us stay in relationships like that. I had a friend talking to, she said she was so miserable in her marriage. That one day she went home, I said, when did you get your divorce number? She said, Les. She said, I went home, put the key in the door, and she said, I couldn't go in. She said, I was so depressed, had so much pain in my body. She said, I couldn't just walk in. She said, I dropped to my knees. She said, I had to crawl in. I had to crawl in the house because it, I just couldn't. She said, I knew then I had to get a divorce. <laughs> so, so that was happened to Joe. And Joe decided to act on that. So what can we do? Well, here's what we can do. Wherever you are, decide that, that you're going to focus your time. I lost my job in broadcasting and it was a major blow to me because broadcasting was all that I had. That's all that I knew. I'd been doing that for like 15 or 20 years. And that's, that was my specialty. But because I was so controversial and couldn't keep my mouth closed, I lost my job. You know, and so it was a depressing time for me and I could not find a job immediately. No one would hire me locally. And because I was good and I would send off my audition tapes to other radio stations, program directors would hear it and they wouldn't bring me in. I was a seasoned veteran. So you have that experience. If you're real good, many people will perceive you as a threat and they won't hire you because they want somebody that they can control and they don't want anybody in there that's going to outshine them. See, sometimes being good can be a liability to you, am I right? Sometimes women have to scale down their ambitions and drive and what they can do in deference to men's egos. So what I did was, in the meantime, in the between time, I started focusing on my flowers. I got into flowers. See, they say when I was a kid, that an idle mind is a devil's workshop. You know, that's true. See, if you don't have anything on your mind, you know your mind can play all kinds of tricks on you, you know. See, when I wasn't busy, sometimes I wanted to call Bert Childs. I said, Bert, can I get my job back? <laughs> 
my mind would say to well, if you, all you had to do, just keep your mouth shut. Now you unemployed. Run in your mouth. Quack, 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 quack. <laughs> Why didn't you just shut up? They told you to shut up. Man told you you're going to get fired. No, you had to keep on talking. Oh, ego, 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 ego. Now you're unemployed. Won't well, nobody hire you because your mouth too big. Mouth too big. <laughs> Stop beating myself up. Why don't I shut up? Boy, you're right. You're right. You know, the boy, you ever talk to yourself? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about? You ever talk to yourself? <laughs> so I just kept busy. I started working on flowers. I got it really into flowers. I knew my flowers had names for my flowers. Grow real good. I talked to them. Hello, how are you today? Oh, you're beautiful. I want you to rise. People would bring their flowers over to me. They were, were dying and wilting. I would speak to them and say, rise. Those flowers straighten up like that. Uh, that was phenomenal, all right? Then the other thing is, I did a lot of volunteer work. I'd go to the hospital and I'd read the Bible to people. And I would go to friends whose parents perhaps were ill or facing a challenge and I'd talk to them. I became involved in all kind of community volunteerism. So I'm saying that if you're going through a challenge, not that you've been laid off, but the universe has given you an opportunity to find your real true making on the planet, then use that time wisely. Volunteer, give yourself away. My high school teacher, Charles L. Williams, said something I love. He said, love and happiness are like perfumes. You can't sprinkle it on others without getting a few drops on yourself. Isn't that beautiful? See, what you give is what? What you get. All right. Repeat after me, please. I'm going to give my life away. Because what you give is what you get. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, share some happiness. Now, here's something else. Fear of change. See, the reason that I think that Joe stayed there as long as he did. Joe feared change. Most people fear change. A lot of people stay in jobs where they're miserable or stay in relationships where they're miserable. Sometimes in order to begin to see the daisies in life, you've got to be willing to change cities, change friends, change relationships, change jobs. See, after a while you get bored doing the same old thing in the same old way, day in and day out. Human beings were designed to achieve. And when you're not on a path of developing your greatness and growing and being more productive and being more effective, then your life literally becomes depressing just like Joe. So Joe was resisting change. And as a result of resisting change, Joe made some trade-offs. See, this psychiatrist talked about the fact but these people who had been on his couch for months and years, not being able to make decisions about things, but when they found out that they were dying, they got up and started making all kinds of decisions. They decided no longer to sell out. And you know what happened to me when I lost my job? You know what I think it was, what life said to me more or less? Les Brown, you know you can do more than what you're now doing. Les Brown, you have sold out. Les Brown, go home. Go in your drawer, pull out your check stubs, and see how much you've sold your soul for. See, one of the things that got me about the movie is what Joe said to his boss after the doctor told him he was going to die. He went back to work and he confronted him. He said, because I was afraid, too afraid to live my life, I sold it to you for $300 a week. I sold my soul for $300 a week. And when I look at Joe, ladies and gentlemen, I know that I'd sold out on myself at different points in my life. That when you go home and you look at, if your life is not what you want it to be, if you're not living the way that you want to live, if you're not experiencing what you want to experience, if it's not giving you what you want, you've got to ask yourself, what have I sold my soul for? Remember that song? 16 ton. And what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Saying, Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Oh no, this is not Luther Vandroff tonight. No. <laughs> Last time I sung, Luther called my hotel and made a bomb threat. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> song is depressing, ladies and gentlemen, that many of us have sold our souls for a home in the suburbs or a brand new car or three meals a day and a roof over our heads or because we want to be popular with our friends. See, when you decide to make a change, 
it's challenging. But there's going to be some resistance. Everybody is not going to agree with that. There's a price to pay. Am I right? See, when I had to think about getting a divorce, it was time for me to grow. And sometimes you stay in a situation too long. Many times you say, well, I, I, I need to do it for the kids. Well, see, staying there too long can be harmful to the kids. I had a friend of mine who finally got a divorce after agonizing it. She said, I stayed there as long as I did for the kids. She said, but if I had it to do over again, I would have left sooner because it wasn't healthy for them. And it wasn't healthy for me. Many of us stay in jobs where it's no longer good for us to be there. But because we can't see ourselves having the capacity to do more and to achieve more and can't see life after that job, we stay there as victims, volunteer victims. Because nobody's making us do it. We volunteer to be victims. We volunteer not to be in charge of our destiny. We volunteer. We willingly do it. If you're going to sell out, don't do it in a hurry. Do it slowly. Let somebody come and have to take it from you. Don't just give it up willingly. And that's what Joe had done. Thinking about a guy who, he had everything going for him. Went to Harvard, became a lawyer, joined a large prestigious law firm, married the perfect wife, had children. And guess what? He was going through the motions day in and day out, but it wasn't giving him what he wanted out of life. He was going through an act. He was acting on a roll. And one day, he couldn't get out of bed. He was just there in bed, couldn't get up, paralyzed. They got the doctors. They looked at him, examined him from head to toe. They said, there's nothing physically wrong with him. Get up, John. Come on, get up. He couldn't get up. He stayed like that for months, had to take therapy. See, because there was dis-ease, there was conflict in his body. Many times when life calling on us to change and to grow and to expand, we said, no, no, I don't want to hear that. No, 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 no. We resist that. So we can go back to that lifestyle of mediocrity. We, we resist that, that change, that growth. We go back so we can go back to sleep. Winston Churchill said the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but at the end, there it is. Carlisle said, truth crushed the earth, shall rise again. And we know scriptures say, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But the truth that will set men free is the truth that men don't want to hear. So we don't want to hear. You got to change. You got to take responsibility for your stuff. You got to clean your act up. You are not your act. You need to get your life together. We don't want to hear that. We want to talk about the circumstances. We want to talk about how bad things are, why we can't do it. See, that's where Joe was. So what we have to do is decide to live with integrity in our relationships and the things that gives our lives some meaning. Stop pretending and decide to become real. Decide that we're not going to trade off because we don't realize what we have in our hands. That you wish you never ever saw. Am I right? I mean, if you never saw him again, it would be too soon. I am I right? I'm going right, all right? So this is what was going on. This guy was going into this job where it was a dead end job. He wasn't happy, he was miserable, and many of us can identify with that. He knew that he was capable of doing more, but he had really given up on himself. He had really sold himself out. Yeah, some of us have done that. He made a trade-off. For whatever reason, he decided to do this. That's why we can identify with him. And the volcano is symbolic of the challenges that we invariably face in life, of the problems that many of us run away from handling. And he had to handle this. And how did he come in contact with this volcano? Well. What happened was he was going to this doctor constantly. He's a hypochondriac because he wasn't living his purpose. His dream had not found his life work. He would create illnesses for himself. And so what happened in the process, this doctor decided, he set him up really. See, when you're not living your goal, you go through life living like a victim. People can set you up for anything. They can call them, go live like a king and die like a man. And Joe said, okay. What did he have to lose? He was going to die anyhow. And his life didn't have any meaning and value to him as it was. So this was no big sacrifice on Joe's behalf. Now that says something about us. 
people, human beings, that when you have not structured your life so that it can have some meaning and value for you, that you'll be willing to throw your life away into anything. See, the volcano could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be a job that does not meet who you are. That you go through life, you're doing it so long, you, you're operating in this and you're acting out that role of mediocrity for so long, you think it's you. It could be a relationship that's no longer giving you what you want and creating dis-ease in your body. It could be any kind of circumstance, like in his work environment, it was toxic, it wasn't good for him. But he didn't have the guts to do anything about it, to act on it. So therefore, it was making him miserable. And as a result, he couldn't see that you were in the area of a volcano. What is it you feel? Heat. Oh, I know, I know. You feel heat, right? So you're going to experience this volcano because we have things in our lives, ladies and gentlemen, and because we don't handle them, because we don't deal with those things, they begin to get kind of hot. You know, you, you've heard the expression, boy, I'm in hot water. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. And that means that there's something that you're in, that some dilemma that you've got to handle, something that you've got to deal with. So let's begin to look at this guy called Joe versus the volcano and let's see what's in it for us. I took the liberty of changing some things to enable them to be symbolic for us. And Tom Hanks plays this role and for those of you that have not seen the movie, it's about a guy who was going to work every day. It was very depressing. I mean when you see it, I mean the photography is very dingy looking and gray and very dim lighting and, and the people are going and looking drab, doing the same old thing every day in the same old way. Some of you work with people like that. Their faces that run any kind of game on you and you go for it. I had a saying when I was in radio, stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. Well, Joe didn't believe in very much, including himself and his dreams, see? So he was very vulnerable. And so Joe was set up by this doctor. This doctor told him that he had a rare disease and he had six months to live. This disease was called a brain cloud. <laughs> oh, Kadumbo Joe went for it. <laughs> he believed it. But you know something? It changed his life. It changed his life. And so he was told, look here, you, you, don't, you don't have long to live anyhow. The guy said, why don't you do this? I'm going to give you all my credit cards, and this way you can live like a king, and there's something I want you to do. There was a catch. There's a volcano on an island that's about to erupt, and, and unless somebody jumps in that volcano, sacrifice their life, these people on this island will perish. Well, your life isn't worth much, and you don't have that long anyhow. <laughs> So why don't you take my credit cards, all my credit cards, American Express, Master Charge, all of them, take all. <laughs> Repeat after me, please. When you're hot, you're hot. When you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm hot this evening. Look out. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Y'all out there fanning like y'all about to get happy or something. Look out. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see you. Now, let me tell you what this is symbolic. We set it up just this way. The reason that we are here this evening to talk about Joe versus the volcano. And so what I wanted you to do was to really experience this. <laughs> now what is it when you're near a volcano that's, that's boiling over and about to explode? What is it that you feel that lets you know